Let's lift our voices and sing great things. Times are refreshing. Very fitting for our theme this morning. Here we go. Come on, let's put our hands together. Strength in your 
say, Father, we need a time of refreshing right now, right now in this service. God, would you blow through this place by your Holy Spirit? Would you come and meet us, Lord? Would you encounter us today? We need you. Lord, we need you. Every hour, God, every moment of every day. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. 
heaven, Lord, that your will be done.
Yeah. 
bless you. Thank you so much, worship team. We always so appreciate your ministry. <clears throat> Pardon me if you were here last week or if you were listening online. You know we've begun a new series for the next few weeks called He Restores My Soul. And of course it's based on the 23rd Psalm written by, <clears throat> by David, King David, who himself for the first part of his life was a shepherd, which I think was so integral for what God had in mind for not only leading his people but to model to his people his own heart. In the Old Testament, you know, many people looked at God, as we know God the Father, as, as many other nations would. I mean, they saw his miracle power and so on, but uh, they didn't grasp the sense that they could have a relationship with him. And so along comes David, a man himself who was a shepherd and who understood the love that a shepherd has for his sheep, that he would actually lay down his life. And we see parallels of Jesus so much in the person of David. And then David, of course, kind of models <clears throat> the heart of God. David just had this beautiful insight into the heart of God. And so in the 23rd Psalm, he refers to God as that shepherd. And, of course, we see that in the New Testament that here is God himself in the flesh, in the person of Jesus. And what does he do in a time where everybody expected him just to come and cast off the Roman oppressors and to set up his own kingdom and rule like kings in that day did? Instead, what Jesus does is he kneels down and takes a basin of water and a towel and begins to wash feet. And he, and he demonstrates that real authority, that really the heart of God in his power is to use his power to serve and, and to release people uh, who are in all kinds of bondages. And Jesus said, that's, that's why I came, uh, to destroy the works of the devil, <clears throat> the Bible says. And so we just see this beautiful revelation. And, of course, we have the 23rd Psalm in which the first few verses, David writes, the Lord is my shepherd. What a beautiful relationship he understood. And because he's my shepherd, uh, there's nothing that I need. I have everything that I need. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still, quiet waters, and he restores my soul. And we mentioned last week how that word uh, <clears throat> soul in the New Testament is translated suke, from which we get our own English word, of course. It has a deal with the in man's understanding, the study of the mind, the psyche or psychology, psychiatry, the, the study of the mind. But actually what that word is, it talks about the study of the soul. That's really what those fields are. And, and really what the soul is, it's the seat of our personality. And I may be wrong in this, but I, I just kind of see the soul as that part of us, kind of like our body, but that part of us emotionally that interacts with the world around us, tangible things. And so our soul is, is made up of our emotions, our feelings, and that's all good things. Our will, uh, good things, but our soul has a tendency to be influenced so much by our natural surroundings, by things we go through, things we experience, things that are spoken into our lives, whatever it may be, our culture, all these things wrestle with us to kind of infiltrate and influence our soul. And the problem with many of us, or the problem many of us have, I should say, is that if we're honest, many times we live at the level of the soul. We live according to how we feel. I mean, we want to do the right thing, we try to do the right thing, but we're led a lot of times by our emotions, by what we've gone through. We allow our perspective to be shaped by, by our experiences, and that's why we find ourselves sometimes when we hear God's truth, you know, we, our, our soul or our natural mind, our natural brain kind of reacts, whether we verbalize it or not, but with an attitude of, well, that may be true for you, but I know from my experience, you know, well, that's nice that God feels that way in his word, but I know from my experience. So what we're doing is we're speaking out of our soul. We're speaking out of our emotions, our feelings, rather than out of our spirit. Our spirit is the only part of us that actually communicates with God. In our soul, we have our natural mind. And you may remember the words of the Apostle Paul that says the natural mind not only cannot understand the things of God, for they are spiritually discerned, they're discerned by your spirit, that part of you that communicates with God, but our natural mind, our flesh, is not able to please God. Not only does it not want to please God, it, it can't please God. And so really what it means to be a child of God, to be born again, to walk in the spirit, is to understand that we're made up of three parts, but our soul, our emotions, and our physical body with all of its natural desires, some good, some bad, all of those are brought into submission to our spirit. So we give our spirit prominence. We hear from the Lord with our spirit. Our spirit is made alive and new in God when we come to Christ. And our journey of sanctification is day by day, decision by decision, as we allow our spirit to have its way over 
our emotions, our fleshly desires, whatever the case may be. As we walk in the Spirit first, then we're able to please God, and we're also able to experience step by step that life that Jesus uh, won for us on the cross. Now, last week we spoke about uh, certain components that really need to be a part of our lives if we're going to create a certain environment on a regular basis where we can begin to see things grow and change in our life. Just like a, a garden I mentioned, you know, you've got to create a certain environment, you've got to weed it, water it, those kind of things, uh, for things to grow. In the same way, I think there's three essential things that must be components in our lives on a regular basis just to cultivate the ground to get some of these other things released. We talked about, for example, lived truth. It's so important that we do the, so much more than just know the truth, but we're, we're living it, we're being changed by the truth of God. We also talked about the need for true fellowship. And I mentioned to me, true fellowship has to do with a, a confessional kind of fellowship, that we find someone, a brother, a sister, a spouse, whoever, that we can be real with, that we're able to bring things into the light rather than in darkness where the enemy plays with our mind or condemns us or whatever. We can bring those things into the light and have somebody agree with us, pray with us, join with us, and just continue to walk in freedom. We also talked about the real need for the presence and power of God in our life to have regular times in solitude and quiet reflection, communion with the Lord, because really most of what the Lord does in our lives is done in our encounters with Him in those quiet places, in those times where our spirits communion with Him. So we talked about those three components. Over the next couple of weeks, I'd like to speak about some actual principles once we've kind of cultivated that atmosphere, that environment, there are certain principles, I think, that as followers of Christ that we really need to understand and we need to begin to apply in our lives if we're going to experience that restoration. If our soul is really going to be healthy, if it's going to be restored, if it's, if it's, if it's going to be whole, and if it's going to be expectant. That, that our soul is really, you know, where it ought to be. And rather than always taking the negative and being dominated by that in our life, it's actually free and whole, and we begin to live with this sense of expectancy for what the Lord is doing and what he has to do in the future. So the first principle, and it's really the only one I want to talk about this morning, is simply <clears throat> your identity. Your identity. You probably noticed when you came in every Sunday, actually, or drive by, there is a building going up in the front of our property, off to the right there, an apartment complex. Well, back in the spring when they began the construction, uh, you know, they took time to prepare the land, and they dug this massive hole, as you can imagine, and it just seemed like it took months just to, you know, meticulously lay this foundation. But what I found surprising is once the foundation was laid, then it, was just, it seemed like just a matter of a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden you get four floors there. And, and the, the obvious thing is that it takes so much time to establish that foundation because if you don't and you begin to build upon it, you're going to have, you know, potentially a damaged building or cracks or, or problems down the road. Well, I believe that our identity is foundational in our walk with Christ. Our identity is essentially what we believe about ourselves. Not so much what others believe or others say, but what we accept as the truth about ourselves. And the thing is, if our identity is, is cracked, if it's faulty, if it's not lined up to what God says, if it's not built on a foundation that is unshakable, then what you're going to discover is whether it's in your relationships, circumstances you go through, whatever, you're going to find these cracks beginning to appear. You're going to believe things you shouldn't believe. You're going to behave in ways you shouldn't behave. You're going to treat others or react to others or situations or make decisions that really begin to shake your life. And, and, and you find after a while that it's really kind of about trying to keep everything in balance and trying to bring everything together when it kind of seems to be falling apart. And a lot of that has to do with the cracks in our life that happen at the level of our soul. And a lot of that is rooted in what we believe about ourselves. Now, in the first few chapters of Ephesians, I won't take time to read them, of course. just want to look at a few verses to start here. But Paul focuses on our relationship with God because of what God the Father has done for us through Jesus in his work on the cross. And he also wants us to understand, despite what we may think, how God the Father actually views us, how he sees us in his eyes. This is an amazing revelation. Look what Paul says in Ephesians 1, 3 to 8. Maybe we can read it responsibly. I'll read the first one. You can come to verse 4. You can read with me. Paul says, how we praise God, the Father of our Lord. I think when Paul, by the way, when he's writing this, I think Paul's just beside himself. 
Like just revelation is just flowing through me. Oh, wow, I can't believe this. He says, how we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in heaven because we belong to Christ. That's a sermon in itself. And I don't even pretend to understand it. But he has blessed us with every blessing in heaven because we belong to Christ. We read verse 4 with me, the next, next uh, slide. Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We who stand before him covered in his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family. Isn't that beautiful? God's plan has always been to adopt us, to save us, to make us his own, by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this. Why? Because he wanted to. He wanted to. And so he did it. Would you read these last few verses with me? Now all praise to God for his wonderful kindness to us and his favor that he has poured it upon us because we belong to his dearly loved son. So overflowing is his kindness toward us that he took away all our sins through the blood of his son by whom we are saved. And he has showered down upon us the richness of his grace. For how well he understands us and knows what is best for us at all times. Paul says that before God made this physical world in which we live, because God is all-knowing, he knew exactly what mankind was going to do. He knew he was going to have to win us back. He knew he'd have to send his son to die in our place. But Paul says, before he made the world, knowing all that was going to go on, God chose you to be his very own. And his choosing you, get this, was not based upon anything you've done. It's not based upon who you are. It's not based upon what you have. It's entirely based upon his love for you. Paul says God the Father adopted you because he wanted you. Isn't that an amazing truth? I mean, anyone who's adopted a child, what's the one thing you usually say to your child? They say, you know what? People have babies, but we chose you to be our baby. See, we chose you. And that's what he's saying. God adopted you because he wants you. With all the baggage, with all what you've come through, whatever may be running through your veins in your sinful nature, God wants you. Now, in the Roman Empire, in, the, in Paul's day, when a person, a child was adopted, they inherited all the rights and privileges of a biological child in this family. Not only did they inherit all those rights and privileges, but this is just as important, they were also simultaneously released from the influence and control of the former family, of the former parents. They didn't belong to them anymore. Those families no longer had any sway over them. They were now part of this new family. They had a new name, and everything this family had was theirs to enjoy. And Paul says God adopted you because he wanted to. And what adoption means is that you belong. Friends, whatever you may feel like, it doesn't matter. The truth is you belong to the family of God. We used to sing it many, many years ago. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I can't believe I remembered that song. I am dating myself. So he says, you have become a full member of God's family the moment the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and you receive, he says, all the gifts that God has for you. Now hear me. If you are now part of the family of God, if you're not, this isn't true of you, but it's offered to you this morning by God. You can leave here with everything I'm talking about. But if you do know Jesus Christ this morning, if you know God the Father, not only are you part of his family, not only have you been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's own dear son. Hear me, friends. But now you are completely released from your past. You are released from every influence, every control of the family of darkness that you used to belong to. The devil is not your father anymore. He has no control over you anymore. 
That's why the only way he can get control over you, as we'll see in a moment, is if he can get you to believe the lies he tells you. He has no right to you anymore. Legally before God, contractually, he has no right. He has no right to your mind. He has no right to speak into your life. He has no right to have any sway over you. In fact, now as a daughter or son of God, not only do you have the right to be called the child of God, not only do you have the right to function as a child of God, you now have, now have right to do damage to the kingdom of darkness. Because you have a new nature. You're a brand new person. And in the eyes of God, you are his child, and he loves you. This is who you are in Christ. This is your identity. And your identity is the foundation of the measure of joy that you experience, the measure of hope, freedom, your well-being. It is all rooted in your identity in Jesus. So Paul describes who we are in Jesus throughout the first three chapters. And in chapter 4, he moves from that foundation of God's love, and he says this in verse 1. In light of all these things, I beg you to live and act in a way worthy of those who have been chosen for such wonderful blessings as these. Paul's not saying, in light of all these things, you better get to work and live up to it. No. He's saying, my prayer is that you would live in everything the Lord has made you that you would begin to live in and enjoy and act like somebody who really understands who you are, who really understands what God has done for you. I believe Paul wants you to know that you can live the life Jesus promises if your identity, if what you believe about yourself is actually rooted in God's amazing love for you. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 17. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand as all God's children should. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of us here this morning as God's children, if we really understood God's amazing love for us, if we really understood what he did for us and the love that compelled him to do that, he says as all God's children should, that you would understand and feel how long, how wide, how deep, how high his love really is. And to experience this love for yourselves. That is not just for somebody else. It's not just the person beside you that's getting blessed. This is for you too. Though it is so great that you'll never see the end of it. You'll never fully know or understand it. And so at last you will be filled up with God himself. Do you see that? How are we filled up with God himself? How do we grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ? It's not through striving. It's through simply understanding how much you're loved. When you really understand how much you're loved, then you begin to realize, wow, Lord, that's all for me. And you begin to grow in the fullness of what it means. And so Paul calls us to live a life where who we are actually influences how we live. He says, if we only understood who we are in Jesus, if we only begun to believe what God believes about us, it would absolutely revolutionize the way we live. It would revolutionize our relationship with our Father. It would revolutionize the things when we wake up in the morning that we would go after. It would revolutionize what we believe God could do through us, transformation he can bring to other people and situations around us. It would totally change all of that. Now, I believe to really understand our identity, we also have to understand our soul and our spirit. I won't go into great detail this morning, but if you know Jesus Christ, the Bible says, you have been made new. Whether that's 50 years ago, five days ago, you are a brand new person. Now, the reason why a lot of us who've walked with the Lord for many years or been Christians for many years, why we're not really living like a new person is because even though our spirit has been made alive, made brand new, we're allowing our spirit to be dominated by our soul. 
We're believing what our soul is saying, what our natural mind is saying, what our culture is saying, what our experiences or our pain or our sin has been saying to us. We allow ourselves to be identified by that, and we love the Lord, we're sincere about the Lord, but we go around our life basically with our head down spiritually thinking, I'm just, I'm just nobody. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. I know I'm a worm. I'm wretched. Thank you for saving me. But I, I just pray I can hold on long enough to get to heaven. So many believers live that way. But listen to what God's Word says. He says to the prophet Ezekiel, this is the prophecy about the people of Israel one day who will accept uh, Jesus the Messiah, and they will experience for themselves what we are experiencing today. But here's the promise. The Lord says, I will give you a what? New heart. I will give you new and right desires. I will give you that. And he says, and I will put a new spirit within you. And here's a word from Paul that we're all familiar with in 2 Corinthians 5, but from a modern translation. He says this, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become what? A religious person? An entirely new person. Now understand, this is God's perspective. This is how he sees you. He says, all that is related to the old order has vanished. Look, everything is fresh and new. God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. That's powerful. You see, one of the evidences that you are a new person is that when you start to put your soul, your feelings, emotions, all that kind of stuff in their proper place, and you begin to live out of the spirit, the new person that you really are, that part of you that communicates with God, you begin to see God do things through you, touching other lives, making life come together, making things work out, making wise decisions, not having regrets all the time. And the fact that you see God flowing through you, changing things and people around you is evidence that you are new because your old man couldn't do that. That old person who didn't know Christ couldn't do that. Even if you're religious but didn't know Jesus, you couldn't do that stuff. But the fact that you're seeing that stuff happen through you should remind you that not only has God saved you and made you a new person, but now he's turned around and said, I'm going to flow through you and help you to reconcile other people to me, and they're going to see the same miracle happen that's happened in you because you are a brand new person. So if you belong to Jesus Christ, then all of these things we just read are true about you. Your spirit has been made alive and new. Now, your soul, on the other hand, though your spirit is brand new, your soul can still be a bit of a mess. And what I mean by that is that you can still have hurts. You can still have shame. You can still have unhealthy beliefs about who you are. All of these things are things the devil will use to try to manipulate you and control you. How does he do that? By trying to make you think and live as if you're still in the old family. You see, what he does by making you believe the lies he speaks to you is he tries to convince you you really haven't been released from your old life. Because if you did, you wouldn't be thinking this way. If you did, this wouldn't happen. Whatever the case may be, he lies to us all in the same way and in different ways. But he uses those lies to try to bring us under his control. But then the Holy Spirit comes along to minister to us, and his ministry to us is to do what? It's to work out in our soul those things that Jesus says, I already am. So I begin to see my spirit, who I am, who's been made alive, who communicates with God. I begin to see my spirit actually have sway over my soul and to bring my feelings and emotions and my limited understanding, my natural mind, to bring all those things into submission to what Jesus says and who is in me, and what he wants me to do, and how he wants me to treat my spouse, how he wants me to make financial decisions that keep me free, all the practical things of my life and ministry included, the Lord wants the, Holy, the Spirit to have prominence in my life. You see, I believe that becoming like Jesus is simply growing in the knowledge of who you already are, of who the Father sees you to be. Because you see, that's what's called walking in faith. It's when thoughts come to your mind, regrets come to your mind, whatever the case may be, and you begin to formulate this way of thinking that begins to shut you down or depress you or rob you of ministry, whatever the case may be, and the Holy Spirit comes along and says, ah, that's not who you are. This is who you are. 
This is what Jesus has done for you. This is who you are in the Father's eyes. And what happens when you begin to believe that, trust the Lord in what he's saying, you begin to become who you are. You begin to act out as to who you really are. Watchman Nee, I shared this quote probably a few months ago. He said this. He said, God is not seeking a display of my Christ-likeness, but a manifestation of his Christ. Will you read that with me? God is not seeking a display of my Christ-likeness, but a manifestation of his Christ. What's he saying? God is not looking for my best efforts to try to be like Jesus. God is looking for my cooperation with the Holy Spirit to allow him to grow who is already in me, to grow Jesus, to allow Jesus to show himself in every part of my life. Your soul is where your thoughts and your emotions try to influence your choices, try to influence what you perceive as reality in your daily life. And until we deal with the issues in our soul, we won't live like an entirely new person. Even though in God's eyes we are, we won't live that way. I mean, if you're a parent, have you ever looked at your child and maybe something they're done wrong or, or some habit they're getting into, whatever, and your heart breaks because you know that's not who you are. You know, you're hanging with a certain crowd or caught up in certain things and your heart breaks because when I look at you, I see everything that, all your potential. I see, you know, the goodness. I see the, you know, the things of what you can be. And it's not a condemnation thing, but our heart breaks because we say, that's not who you are. That's not who you are. And you see, when we as a child get that into our heart, then we say, you know what, why am I doing this? I'm sure many of us have had that kind of revelation, you know, hanging with a certain crowd or doing certain things for different reasons, trying to be cool or accept it, whatever. And the day just kind of comes, you realize, why am I doing this? It's just killing me or whatever, you know? And you begin to realize, hey, that's not who I am. So again, working out your identity is learning to become who you already are, who you already are. Now, I think the main problem with our identity is that we often believe lies about ourselves rather than the truth. The power of a lie is only in our agreement with that lie. That's where the real power is. The lie itself is not true, but it becomes true if I agree with it. I don't know if this ever happened to you, but here's what happens to me once in a while. Things are going along great, loving the Lord, serving the Lord, whatever. And then a thought comes into my mind from something 20 years ago, something 30 years ago. I could tell you some stories, and you would say, Pastor Paul, you're an idiot. I mean, with love, but you would think that. And, and, you know, and I would kind of probably agree with you because that's the thought that comes to my mind. Something that happened years ago. It may be something I did unknowingly. It may be a decision I made knowingly at the time, but it was stupid, whatever. But you see, the problem is this, that memory comes back. Even if it's something that I know the Lord's forgiven me about or it's long past and I can't change it, that memory comes back and I begin, if I'm not careful, to think about it and to dwell on it. And what happens? Even though I'm a different person today, even though I'm forgiven, I've grown, I've matured, if I give place in my soul, in my mind, to that thing, I don't just remember what I did. I begin to associate that action with who I am. And I begin to say things to myself like, man, what was I thinking? I can't believe I did that. What a stupid thing to do. And then you know what happens? You begin to think, man, who am I fooling? I am stupid. Seriously. I'm stupid. What am I doing, pastor, in the church? What a hypocrite. You know, it just goes on and on and on if you allow it. That is the power of a lie. It doesn't mean that you didn't do that. But when the Lord forgives our sin, when we confess our sin, he forgives us, he says, as far as the east is from the west, I've removed your sin from you, and I remember it no more. It is buried in the deepest sea, and I never bring it up. The only person that brings it up, you know what? It's not even you. It's your enemy. And he will send a thought through your mind just that fast, and it's up to you whether you let it go through, to say, that's a lie, forget it, or you go, whoa, what was that? Oh, man, I remember that. 
I remember that. That's exactly how the enemy, am I the only one? I mean, confession's good for the soul, but any of you ever deal with that kind of stuff? Yeah, I know, I know. And some of you are real spiritual. I can't relate. I've been walking with the Lord for 50 years, and you know, yeah. Well, you got a problem with lying, so we'll, we'll pray for that later. Friends, we're on the same boat. That's how the enemy battles us. Amos says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? doesn't matter whether it's the devil or the Lord. Friends, whoever you agree with determines where you're going to walk. Who you agree with is what you give power to. The Bible says in Romans 12 and 2, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. And I don't think Paul is only talking about the things that you do. He's talking about what you believe, the lying spirit of the culture in which we live. He says, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. In other words, stop walking in agreement with your culture. Your culture wants to rob, steal, kill you. Don't care what your culture says. Isn't it funny? This is totally unspiritual. But can you believe the styles that are back in today? I was watching a bit of the Super Bowl, and I saw all these commentators in these ridiculous suits, the big squares and the checkers and the big ties. I'm thinking, man, we wore that in the 70s, and we burned it and vowed we'd never wear that again. It looked so stupid back then, and it looks stupid today. But our culture says, you know what, we need to sell stuff, so we're going to go back to something you, you haven't seen in your lifetime, and you know what, because we know you, you're going to buy it. And because somebody else wears it, you're going to think it's in style, and you're going to wear it, and you're both going to look stupid. That's our culture. That is our culture. I know I'm wearing brown shoes, and they're kind of in style now too, but they've always been in style. I mean, for any of us who've lived, I mean, no word of a lie, I prophesy Within the next year, there are going to be white belts and white patent leather shoes. I promise you. I promise you with pink dress pants. It's coming back. And you have my permission when you see it to point and just laugh because it looks ridiculous. But you see, that's our culture. And our culture doesn't only tell us how we should look on the outside. Our culture tells us what we should think about us in the inside. And Jesus says, how long are you going to play this dumb game? How are you going to keep going in circles, believing, believing, believing the lies? Why don't you break that, look the devil in the face and say, you're an idiot. I can't believe you're saying that. I mean, you're, you're crazy. You tried that 30 years ago. Hey, I'm not wearing that anymore. That's not in style for me anymore. I'm going to call it what it is, and I'm going to live in the truth of who the Lord says I am. He says, be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit. How? Through a total reformation of how you think. That's how you get transformed. That's how your soul gets healed. That word transform in the Greek language, we know it is metamorpho. It's the same in the English language. Metamorphosis, right? A caterpillar, right? You don't just stick wings on a caterpillar and it flies. You see a butterfly. You would never know unless you knew science that a butterfly came from a pillar. Caterpillar, it's totally different. Totally transformed. The Lord says that's what happened in you when you became a brand new creature in Jesus Christ. You've given wings. You're a new being. You now soar with the eagles. That's who the Lord has made you. Now, what's interesting is that word metamorpho is only used four times in the New Testament. Two times it speaks of Jesus on the mountaintop with his disciples when there was this spiritual revelation. The Lord just began to show his glory. They saw what was inside him. Two of the four times speaks about Jesus. You know what's neat? The other two times in the New Testament, it speaks of your transformation in God's eyes because that same Jesus is in you. The exact same change, revelation, that the disciples saw Jesus manifest, he wants you to know that's now in you. If the Lord could reveal his glory like he did in the mount, you would see the exact same thing that the disciples saw in Jesus. In fact, I remember C.S. Lewis said a number of years ago, he said, if we could truly see, I'm paraphrasing, the glory of the presence of Christ that is in every believer, we would be tempted to bow down and worship them. That's how glorious and splendor the presence of the Lord in us. That's the transformation that has taken place. So Paul says it's only when that truth changes us inwardly that we have this new way of thinking and can actually begin to live the life that we were born for. How does that work? I'm going to close with this. We shared this last week. Jesus said in John 8, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Now, here's the key. 
It's not enough to have knowledge of the truth. You need to secure your identity in the truth of who God says that you are. And that doesn't happen by accident. What God says to you and what he says about you, friends, that's why we need to be in the word of God on a regular basis. We need to hide the word of God in our heart. Because you'll notice when the devil came to tempt Jesus, what's the first thing he said? If you are the son of God, what was he doing? He was attacking his identity. If Jesus would believe him and begin to think, what, what do you mean if I am? I, I, I'm sure I am. But Jesus doesn't do that. If you are, and Jesus says, it is written. It is written. We need the word of God in our heart. That when the devil comes to tempt us or he comes to lie to us, we don't have a conversation. We just say, it is written. What are we saying? God's truth says. God is true, and you're a liar. So what God says about you has to be deeply interwoven into your daily thoughts and behaviors. And what that means is that you have to learn to hold on to the truth at that very moment when the lie is trying to embed itself in your heart and to prevent you from being who you already are. That's what it means to be made free in the Lord. The lie comes to us, and at that moment, we don't play with it. We hold on, Jesus says, to the truth. For example, if you grew up in a home where you were abused, then you probably struggle with the lie that maybe there's something wrong with you or that you aren't lovable. Or maybe through your younger years or maybe even today, you have been tied up in sexual activity because you're trying to secure that sense of love or being needed or whatever it may be. But that just leaves you with more shame and brokenness because you know that it's not the way to find that. That's not who you are in Jesus. Jesus says you are forgiven. You are adopted. God the Father chose you out of a heart full of love for you because he wants to make you whole. When you close with that scripture, Ephesians 1 and 4, can we read it together? We read it at the opening of the service. Ephesians 1 and 4, Paul writes, Long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Jesus would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We who stand before him covered with his love. You see, God didn't choose you because he looked down through time, through hundreds or thousands or maybe even millions of years before you were made. He didn't choose you because he looked down through time and he saw that you were deserving. He saw that you're going to be good. When he looked down through time, he saw every single one of us the same way. He saw you're broken, you're sinful, and you're lost. But he wanted you because he loves you. And part of love is he wants to share with you everything that he is. And God is holy. You know what that means? It means God is whole. There's nothing lacking, nothing broken. He's whole. And he wants to pour that wholeness into you. He wants his DNA in you as his child. I'm going to ask the worship team to join me. Friends, whenever you are tempted to feel worthless, unlovable, dirty, unsalvageable, you know what you need to do? You need to hold on to the truth. And I say hold on because it's a battle. The devil will come to you in a hundred different directions, a hundred different logical ideas that make sense. And only if you know the truth of what the Father says about you do you have a hope. But you have to hold on to that. Because the truth alone won't make you free. But holding on to the truth in the face of the lie over and over and over and over again is what makes you free. Those are identity-forming moments in our lives. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? You know, all of us are affected by lies. They form us by the way things happen to us, by the things that we're told. Those lies form in our minds and our lives by the pains that we suffer, the culture we live in, our own sin, the attacks of the devil. There's a thousand different things. And these lies will block us from the truth of what is our birthright as sons and daughters of God. We can't ignore those lies. We have to confront them. And we have to cast them out. 
so that we can build our lives on the foundation of our true identity. And our true identity is rooted in what Jesus has done for us and who Jesus says we are when he looks at us. And he says, you are chosen, not forsaken. You are forgiven. You are clean. You are holy. You are my child. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Over and over again, Paul says, God wanted us. So he did what he did through Jesus. So he could take care of all the issues. Take care of all the things that blocked that and set us free. Whom the Son has set free is truly, completely free. So stop believing the lies. As the worship team sings this song, as our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here this morning, I want to encourage you. And for those who are watching online, just to bow your heart for a moment. And maybe the Holy Spirit has already been bringing things up, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak deep within your heart and to show you some of the lies that you have believed, some of the things you've agreed with. And I want to ask you to do three simple things. Number one, repent. doesn't mean you're beating yourself up. You're just saying, Father, forgive me for believing the lie about this or that. Number two, turn to the devil and simply say, in Jesus' name, I break off my agreement with you. You are a liar, and I will no longer agree with you in this area of my life. And then number three, just open your heart and say, Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and to minister truth in that area. I invite you to come and heal and restore my soul. So just open your heart this morning for a few moments. If you don't know Jesus, just simply open your heart to him and say, Jesus, I don't understand it all, but I know that I'm not whole. I'm broken, and I sense your presence this morning. I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me for living life without you. I open my heart to you, and I ask you to come in and cleanse me and make me that new person that they're talking about this morning.